Today, I'm going to take you on a journey all the way from the days of core memory on through the birth of the internet, as seen from the vantage point of the venerable PDP-11 computer. We use my own PDP-1134 from 1976 as a starting point, diving into the era when core memory, tiny magnetic rings strung together like chainmail, was the cutting edge of computer storage technology. This machine, a hallmark of its time, represents an important chapter in computing history, a period when many computers were bridging the gap between the large, inaccessible mainframes of the past and the more personal, interactive computing that would follow. The Internet was effectively born on PDP-11s, but the history of these machines goes back much further. The PDP-11 played a crucial role in the early development of ARPANET, the precursor to the Internet. Many of the first nodes on ARPANET, including those at research institutions like MIT, UCLA, and Stanford, ran on PDP-11s. These computers were ideal for networking experiments due to their affordability, flexibility, and powerful architecture, making them accessible to universities and research labs that were pioneering computer networking at the time. However, the story of the PDP-11 begins long before its involvement with the birth of the Internet. The PDP-11 was the culmination of nearly two decades of innovation in computing. Deck's journey began in 1957 when Digital Equipment Corporation was born into a computing landscape dominated by massive mainframes that only the biggest corporations, government agencies, or academic institutions could afford. Those giants were complex, expensive, and required at least an entire room to operate. Ken Olson and Harlan Anderson were both coming off years at the MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where they had worked on some of the most cutting-edge digital technology of the time. Olson, a brilliant engineer with a strong entrepreneurial spirit, wasn't content with just pushing the envelope of technology. He wanted to bring it directly to the people in ways they had not yet imagined. Echoing the sentiments of Henry Ford before him and foreshadowing the approach of Steve Jobs later, instead of giving people what they wanted, he decided to give the people what they didn't know that they needed yet. Together, they founded Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, in an old wool mill in Maynard, Massachusetts, with a bold 1950s mission to build affordable computers that people could actually interact with, shifting away from the monolithic, operator-driven machines that ruled the day. Mainframes were designed primarily for batch processing, where jobs were collected or batched together and processed sequentially as they came in. Users would prepare their programs on punch cards or tape and submit them to a system operator. The operator would then queue up the job along with many others and run them on the mainframe in a non-interactive, automated sequence. As a programmer, for example, you might write your assembly code on paper and then have a key punch operator translate it into a card deck. You would then insert the deck for the assembler in front of yours, and when the whole stack of cards finally got its turn to be processed, you'd get your output. If you were lucky, it worked. More likely, you got back an assembler error and you got to repeat the process. In a world where I can compile the entire Linux kernel in under 19 seconds, multi-hour turnarounds for a trivial change sounds pretty painful. And so, deck strategy was quite radical for its time but they didn't immediately dive into building computers. Instead, they started selling digital laboratory modules that engineers could use to test other digital equipment. This approach allowed them to generate some revenue and gain a foothold in the market without taking on the enormous costs with developing a computer from scratch. It also fit in with their philosophy of providing tools that users could touch, feel, and understand, a far cry from the opaque, unapproachable mainframes offered by their competitors. Dex founding wasn't just a technical challenge, it was a financial one too. Venture capital was nearly unheard of in the tech space of the 1950s. Still, DEX founders managed to secure $70,000 from the American Research and Development Corporation, a venture fund that would later profit a tidy sum when DEC went public. This was one of the earliest examples of venture capital fueling a tech company's growth, a model that has since become the norm in Silicon Valley and beyond. By 1960, just three years after its founding, DEC was ready to release its first computer, the PDP-1, or Programmed Data Processor 1. They very explicitly called them processors rather than computers. And the PDP-1 was like a revelation. Unlike the massive IBM mainframes that dominated the industry, the PDP-1 was a smaller, cheaper machine designed for interactive use. It didn't just calculate numbers. It could play music, it could play games, and it could be programmed and reprogrammed by its users in ways that were never possible before. The PDP-1 was the birth of the mini-computer revolution a whole new category of computers that would bridge the gap between the gargantuan mainframes and the personal computers that were still decades away. Now, DEC's approach wasn't just about size or cost. It was about reimagining what computers could be used for. Their machines were designed to be accessible, programmable, and user-friendly, and it worked. Following the success of the PDP-1, DEC released a series of increasingly sophisticated computers, the PDP-4, the PDP-7, the very popular PDP-8, and the mainframe class PDP-10. 
Each one brought new innovations, whether it was in packaging, speed, or affordability, and each helped to cement DEC's position as a leader in the mini-computer market. By the late 1960s, DEC had become the second largest computer company in the world, second only to IBM. But it was the PDP-11, released in 1970, that truly solidified DEC's reputation as a titan in the industry. The PDP-11 was not just a computer. It was a technological marvel. It introduced a new open bus architecture known as the Unibus, and later QBus, which allowed a wide range of peripheral devices to connect seamlessly, vastly expanding the computer's versatility in its applications. Now, the Unibus was a revolutionary innovation because it unified memory and I.O. transfers on a single, shared bus architecture. This meant that all devices connected to the Unibus, including the CPU, memory, disk drives, and other peripherals, could communicate directly with one another without needing separate channels or complex interface logic. The simplicity of this single bus design reduced the overall complexity and cost of the system, making it more affordable and easier to maintain and manufacture. Furthermore, the Unibus was modular, allowing new devices to be easily added, removed, or replaced. This plug-and-play capability enabled a wide range of configurations and expansions, making the PDP-11 adaptable to various applications, from laboratory research to industrial automation. Engineers and programmers could design custom peripherals or modify existing ones without needing to redesign the entire system, giving the PDP-11 a level of versatility that was unmatched at the time. By allowing direct memory access, or DMA, and supporting multiple devices without a significant drop in performance, the Unibus facilitated faster and more efficient data transfer. This ability to handle mixed data loads efficiently was critical for the multi-user time-sharing environments that were becoming commonplace in the 1970s. This flexibility, combined with its affordability, made the PDP-11 a massive success across a wide range of industries. The PDP-11 also pioneered several technological milestones. It was one of the first computers to transition from core memory to modern RAM, and then from discrete transistor logic to large-scale integration chips. This wasn't just about making the computer faster or smaller. It was about redefining what was actually possible. Perhaps more importantly, the PDP-11 supported multiple operating systems, including a little-known one called Unix, which would go on to become one of the most influential pieces of software in the history of computing. Unix was originally developed on a PDP-7 by AT&T's Bell Labs, and it soon found a natural home on the PDP-11. The combination of the 11's robust hardware and Unix's portability and flexibility created a perfect storm for innovation. The PDP-11's architecture directly influenced Unix's development, and in turn, Unix's growth helped drive adoption of the 11. This symbiotic relationship is a great example of how DEC's innovative hardware strategy enabled the growth of revolutionary software. The PDP-11 also served a pivotal role in the development of the C language, and common lore holds that the pre- and post-increment operators in C are a direct reflection of the PDP-11 assembly language instructions that do pretty much the same thing. Under the leadership of Ken Olson, DEC was not just a technological pioneer, it was a cultural one as well. Olson's management style was refreshingly progressive for the time. He promoted a flat, non-hierarchical organizational structure and was known for his open-door policy and his commitment to fair hiring. DEC was one of the first companies in the tech space to actively hire female engineers and they also offered unique benefits like mortgages and loans to buy homes. Olson believed that if you treated your employees well, they would be more productive, more innovative, and more loyal. This approach fostered a collaborative and creative environment that attracted some of the best minds in the industry. It's hard to overstate just how beloved Olson appears to be. In every story you can find told by former employees, the praise is pretty much unanimous. As the years went on, the computing landscape continued to evolve, and DEC transitioned from the PDP series to other architectures, such as the VAX and then the Alpha systems. While these new systems were powerful and innovative in their own right, they couldn't quite replicate the magic behind the PDP-11. By the 1990s, as the market shifted towards personal computers and client-server models, DEC struggled to adapt. The company was eventually acquired by Compaq in 1998, which was later absorbed into Hewlett-Packard. DEC had customarily viewed software almost as a necessary evil needed to sell the hardware, and this approach helped, at least in part, seal its fate in an era when companies like Microsoft were building ecosystems around software and not hardware. Back in their glory days, the PDP-11s were a sight to behold. The 1170 was the best known of the line, in no small part due to its beautiful Das Blinken light control panel. They were smaller than their mainframe cousins, but smaller is a relative term. A PDP-1170 installation would consist of at least one to three equipment racks, depending on its configuration and the number of peripherals included. 
Each rack was equivalent to a 40U unit, about 6.5 feet tall, and used the now standard 19-inch rack form factor. The primary rack would house the main CPU and its related components. This rack typically contained the M8190 CPU board, which was the heart of the PDP-11 and held the processor complex. Now, the processor was not just a single chip, but a series of large boards built around 2901 bit slice ALUs. Alongside the CPU board, the rack would also include memory modules such as the memory boards. These boards were capable of holding up to 4 megabytes of memory, which was a significant amount for its time. To improve performance, especially for data-heavy tasks, the system might also include an M8191 cache controller, which adds high-speed cache memory to accelerate the processing speed. The same rack would also host the Unibus interface components, specifically the 9301 and 9302 boards. These boards were essential for managing communication between the various modules and peripherals connected to the Unibus, DEX proprietary computer bus. The system also included a console terminal interface, often through an M7800 or M7859 board, which allowed operators to interact directly with the system for input and output operations, monitoring, and debugging. Additional racks were typically required for peripherals and storage. A second rack might be dedicated to mass storage devices, which could include multiple types of disk drives, such as RK05 removable packs or RLO2 drives, and larger fixed storage drives that were commonly used with the PDP-1170 systems. These storage devices were vital for both data storage and swapping, especially in the environments where the PDP-11 was used for multi-user or time-sharing applications. A third rack might be used to house additional peripherals or specialized expansion modules, such as magnetic tape drives for backup and archival purposes, high-speed line printers for output, or communications interfaces for networking. The PDP-1170 often found itself in environments where connectivity to other systems was crucial, so this rack could also include network controllers, additional serial interfaces, and other connectivity hardware. Of course, if more equipment were needed, more racks could be added. The storage bus could be extended up to about 50 feet in total length, and a well-equipped 1170 could be expanded far enough to rival your average mainframe in size if needed. Since no one has seen fit to donate an 1170 to the channel yet, I recently bought an 1134 out of Oregon and have mostly completed its restoration. The 1134, introduced by DEC in 1976, stands out in the history of computing for several reasons. It was a mid-range model in the PDP-11 series that combined affordability with powerful performance, making it accessible to a broader range of users from small businesses to educational institutions and research labs. At a time when computing technology was still very expensive, the PDP-1134 struck an attractive balance between cost and capability, offering many of the features of higher-end systems without the associated price tag. A research lab might be able to invest in 1170, but a medium-sized business would likely find the 1134 a better fit for their budget. When new, they ran about $20,000, which is equivalent to about $100,000 today. The PDP-1134 was designed with cost-effectiveness and simplicity in mind, but it didn't sacrifice versatility. It also used the Unibus architecture, which made the PDP-1134 highly modular and expandable. The machine featured a simplified console interface, the KY11LB console, which enabled direct control of the system's operations and diagnostic functions. This console, while basic, provided critical functionality for managing the computer, making it user-friendly for both experienced technicians and those fairly new to computing. One of the most noteworthy aspects of the PDP-1134 was its role in the spread of computing in academic and scientific environments. Its relatively low cost and expandability made it a favorite among universities and research institutions. For many computer science students in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the PDP-1134 served as their introduction to computing. Success has many fathers, but most credit the 1134 almost single-handedly to an engineer named Bob Armstrong. Armstrong was known for his practical approach to computer design, emphasizing functionality, reliability, and user accessibility. While not much is publicly documented about Armstrong's personal stories or quirks, his engineering philosophy is evident in the design choices of the PDP-1134. The system was built to last and to be easily maintained, with many components accessible for repair or replacement by users. This made the 1134 particularly popular in environments where uptime and reliability were critical, such as in industrial and scientific research. My own 1134 came with a wide variety of analog-to-digital capture equipment. The PDP-1134 was also popular for its ability to be integrated into a variety of applications, from process control in manufacturing to data processing in business. If you ever wondered what was running assembly lines in the 70s and 80s, there's a good chance it was a system like this. 
This versatility and dependability led to widespread use and a passionate following amongst its users. Enthusiasts of the PDP-1134 often recount stories of using these machines well beyond their expected lifespans, a testament to their robust design and the loyalty that they inspired among those who use them. Now, I've got three main PDP-11s up and running in my shop. First, there's the 1134. Next up is a PDP-1123 Plus that has been upgraded with the J11 LSI CPU. It features an Ethernet controller and runs BSD-211 that is connected to the internet where it serves its own homepage. Next up is a PDP-1183, one of the last of the line from the 1980s. The 1183 is close to maxed out with a disk controller, floppy controller, 8-port serial board, Cubone, Ethernet controller, and much more. It's my most powerful PDP, and on most tasks, it is actually more powerful than the original 1170. I'd like to show you how I got Unix and RSX and RT11 running on these systems and how I brought them up live on the web, but I'm simply out of time. So if you're interested in such topics, I'd like to make the videos, so please make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And if you're already a subscriber, please be sure to check out my second channel, Dave's Attic, linked in the video description, where you can find our weekly podcast that goes live every Friday at 4 p.m. The Attic is where I put content that might not be algorithm-friendly, so if you enjoy it, please be sure to subscribe to it and then turn on notifications so you actually get to see the content. Now, if you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum. It's intended for folks that do not have a diagnosis but who suspect they might have a few traits in common with people on the spectrum. It's everything I know now about living a great life on the spectrum that I wish I had known long ago. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.